All right, so uh, let's look a little bit at how matching models have evolved over time to try to improve their realism. So we'll um, list the different models. We'll, um, actually, they can all be separated by looking at their um, production function. And their wage function. We can give a couple of references also if you're interested in looking more and also to tie that up with the um, readings that are assigned to the course. Right, so um, the classical model, the standard matching model, which is um, the first version of the model that was developed. Um, so in terms of production function, what was assumed was a linear production function. So how does that look? That gives you an output y, which is equal to a, the uh, labor productivity, it's a parameter times n, the number of uh, producers in the firm. So that's what you have. In terms of wage function, what was um, typically assumed was that there was a bargaining between workers and firm. And, you know, um, in particular, one uh, kind of assumption that was introduced originally was that there was a surplus sharing. between workers and firm. That was a specific type of assumption that was used. Um, that was another alternative that has been used, but the two are often equivalent. Actually, it was a Nash bargaining. That's often what you see in the literature, but in most of the cases, using Nash bargaining or using just directly surplus sharing um, is completely equivalent. Um, and what we saw in the previous lecture was how to compute the weight that comes out of um, surplus sharing. Um, so there was a bargaining and the solution was given by surplus sharing. The expression for the wage, in case um, you don't remember, is that once we assume surplus sharing, your wage is going to be W is one minus beta times Z, where beta is workers' bargaining power, Z is the value of unemployment, plus uh, beta A one plus r theta. Okay, so that's the way that comes out of surplus sharing, but would also come out actually in standard setup from dash bargaining. So that was the assumption, and then the key people who contributed to that are um, Dale Mortensen, uh, who had an important paper in 1982 on this, uh, Peter Diamond, who also had a 1982 paper, which was actually the first one to introduce surplus sharing, and then um, Chris Pissarides, who had an influential paper in 1985 that put everything together, uh, all these different pieces. Um, and of course, um, these three researchers got the Nobel Prize in 2010 for developing that matching model. So that was uh, that the standard model. Uh, now, what the uh, issue with this model, why has it evolved? Uh, well, as we said, the problem is that um, in that model, when you have fluctuation in productivity, 
is a generic fluctuation in labor market tightness, unemployment, vacancies that are way too small compared to what we see in the data. Okay, so um, uh, the main issue is that fluctuations in productivity uh, yeah, do not deliver sufficient fluctuations in unemployment vacancies and tightness. Or if you want uh, fluctuations in productivity, they are absorbed too much by fluctuation in wages to be able to deliver realistic fluctuations in unemployment vacancies and tightness. Uh, so, tightness, unemployment, um, vacancies do not fluctuate Uh, do not fluctuate sufficiently over the business cycle. So that means that if you have um, realistic fluctuation in productivity, the type of fluctuation in labor market variables that you get out of it is just uh, not sufficient. Uh, so formally, What we showed is that the formal statement is that the elasticity of uh, tightness, and of course, once you have the elasticity of tightness, you can infer that the elasticity of unemployment and, and vacancies is also not going to be sufficient because tightness determines everything in the model. Elasticity of tightness and with respect to productivity, which we denoted epsilon theta a, uh, is much too small in. Uh, so of course that's a quantitative statement, so in the calibrated version of the model. And so what we showed is that, for instance, if Z, the value of unemployment is zero, then epsilon, which is not actually unrealistic, epsilon theta is equal to zero, if Z is equal to 0 0.4, which you know is another calibration and again you know quite realistic. Then we get epsilon theta a is equal to two thirds. But of course in the US, as we have viewed, epsilon theta is equal to eight. Um, so the, the response of tightness to productivity shock is much, much larger in the US than in the calibrated version of the model. Um, and so the diagnostic, the issue here, is that um, wedges are too flexible. And so what that means is that they absorb too much of the fluctuation in productivity. So when productivity goes up, which would normally stimulate firms you know, to hire more workers because that boosts, boosts their profitability, wages go up too much and so they absorb too much of that increased profitability and at the end, firms don't really have a big incentive to hire more. Similarly, when productivity falls, which normally would lead firms to hire much less, now wages fall a lot, and so at the end, the incentive of firms to hire fewer workers are not very strong, so they don't really change their behavior too much. Not too flexible, so the wages absorb uh, too much of um, uh, 
of um, productivity fluctuation. And um, you can see a discussion, of course, of all of these problems in uh, the two articles that are assigned. So in China, 2005 in particular. Okay. Uh, and so what's the solution to that problem? Well, the solution was pretty simple. It was because wages are too flexible in the basic model, so they are too flexible. Uh, that's because of the bargaining, sur of the surplus sharing solution. So the solution is just to replace the wage function um, to obtain. more rigid wages. Once you do that you're going to get uh, you're going to get a model that generates much bigger uh, business cycle fluctuations. 